Let's do a little round. Uh, maybe Ryan first. Okay, just introduce myself. Yeah, um, my name is Ryan Carniato. I'm uh, author of a JavaScript framework called SolidJS. Uh, I also worked on, uh, on Marco, which is another JavaScript framework at eBay for a few years. Um, I've been doing web development for like 25 years now, roughly, uh, working professionally, and then found myself now working at open on open source and Netlify. I basically just work on JavaScript frameworks full, full time. Um, so that's kind of my area of expertise performance and uh, reactivity, um, essentially the areas that I do a lot of my research and development with. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Chen? I'm Jen Luker. I have been working in the tech industry for about 20-ish years, but I've got about 35 years worth of experience in the field. Uh, I am currently a engineering manager, though just before that I was a principal engineer working at uh, multiple companies. Uh, the previous most notable ones, I guess, are Gremlin, uh, which is Chaos Engineering as a Service. And before that was working at a company called Formidable Labs, which is a contracting company. So I worked for others like Starbucks and uh, Wirecutter and various other relatively large names. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so I'm Mads from France. And I'm working at a company named Always Data. Uh, it's a hosting provider. And as a developer here, I'm in charge of the, developer ex the whole developer experience. So I'm mainly focused on um, building and designing the experience in the demo interfaces and command line usage to help people to work with our platform by designing and developing tools um, dedicated to that. Thank you. So now you can see we have some really experienced uh, web developers, uh, really the people that know a lot of answers. And because of that, there's like one basic rule that there are no stupid questions. So really use the platform. First question is, uh, what web development framework do you really like and why? All right. Um, I mean, the, that might seem like an easy answer for me because I'm an author of, of a web framework, so I could just say my own. Um, uh, it's it is uh, it, it's an interesting question though because I'm I'm a lover of all of JavaScript frameworks. They all have different qualities to them. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm going to cave obviously and just say my own because it's the easiest answer. But I I, I like I like reactivity. Um, it's a big thing for me, so I'm a big fan of. Uh, frameworks that incorporate reactivity, um, like uh, SolidJS, um, Svelte, Vue, um, those those type of frameworks, big big on on me. Go for it, Jen. There are pros and cons to every framework, and the beauty of them is learning from each other as they evolve and develop. Uh, when it comes to which ones I like, I have specific ones that work very well with the way that I think. And those aren't necessarily going to be the same ones that work well with how you think, which is again, why it's a beautiful thing to have multiple frameworks that work differently. Is the fact that uh, React does work really well with how I think I very much like, like vanilla JavaScript if I can possibly get away with it. And React allows me to incorporate a lot of that into it. Angular is beautiful if you're trying to get into a, a larger company that already has established rules. You basically walk in and you already know how every system works in Angular. Vue is kind of like a marriage of the two. And React is a bit more like, you know, cowboy programming of anything goes and it makes it highly flexible, but it also <coughs> makes it complex to try to step into any new code base. Not much. Yeah. Um... I don't have a specific framework that I really like. I guess the best framework is the one that fits well for your needs at a specific moment and for what you love to do. Personally, I prefer that when the things are more declarative, like something in, in Vue.js because um, the DOM and the template is hosting almost everything that you need, like declaring the states and the bindings and so on. But um, it could lead you at some point to to something where you're, I don't know, struggling into different kind of issues that you can solve easily and where most engineered 
oriented framework like React or Angular uh, should be useful for this specific use case. So depending on what you are trying to build and, um, and yeah, your, your own feelings, um, you have to pick the right one, which could definitely not be the same depending on the project. Um, that, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, prior, I think this career in, in development, I did a lot of things and I worked briefly for graphic design at some point and especially for printing. And I wasn't um, that aware of the whole process used by professional printers um, like I know how the machines work and how they, they work with that and, and so on. But you have to speak a common language with the people you are working with. So you have to understand what is a space color when you are working with, in the printing industry and so on. So I guess this is exactly the same thing when you are working for the web industry, even if you are not a developer at some point, you have to speak a common language, having some kind of communication and, and tools to help you to communicate with your teammates and your coworker. It could be a, a small amount of understanding how the technology is working and, and yeah, under the hood. But um, yeah, I guess that um, you, you have to find a way to be humble enough to understand the, the answers from your coworkers and feel free to just reach out saying, okay, I don't really understand the implications. So could you just enlighten me on this specific point? So uh, I can add one comment. And it's sort of, people like to say that uh, design systems are sort of the common language. That you create a design system as a developer so that you have common concepts. So it's sort of, um, you have common patterns. Like in architecture, you know what the facade. Uh, and every, when you know what's a facade, well, you're like one step ahead. So I guess it's something like this when you deal with design developers and non developers. And it, like learning the common concepts. Does anybody have anything to add? To I this? have lots to add. <laughs> <laughs> so much to add. All right. One, if you, have, if you have a design system, you're already ahead of the game for most. Most don't. Or most are always evolving and most of it's broken or parts of it work, but other parts don't. Or we have 27 one-offs of the same button. So having an individual design system is not as common as we would like. So it's still developing that communication and that common language is going to be important. Uh, two, <clears throat> whatever the developer says, multiply it by three, and then you might get closer to when it'll actually be done. <laughs> Just assume that right off the bat. Um, three, when it comes to designing and developing a product, you have the features that you want, and the features that you plan for and the features that you end up with. And those are all three different things. You can have budget, you can have features, or you can have a deadline. You can only have two of those at any given time. You cannot have all three. It will never work out to have all three. And what you choose may vary from time to time. You may choose that you have to have this deadline, which means you need more people and in order to reach the feature set that you want. Or you're fine with the budget, which means you have the number of people that you have and it'll get done when it gets done with the feature set that you have. Or you're gonna have to cut features to make a deadline and budget. But you can only ever have two. Another thing is with those, it is very easy to code it for yourself to create it for the people that you work with and to forget that there's a whole swath of people that have varying disabilities, either circumstantial or physical or temporary or long-term or a combination. So try to think outside of your experience when you're developing these things. Uh, something that I like to say is that it's not the, the edge cases that you have to worry about, it's the stress cases. So who could be hurt by what you're developing? That's a good, good answer. Do you have anything to add? <laughs> 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 I, 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 I have a question. 
question related to this question. So what should developers understand from the business side? So as a developers, what should be learned uh, to deal with the business people? Because they seem like they're not that, the same, a little bit different. Yeah, that's, that's something I have a bit more experience with because I've spent m m pretty much my whole career in, on the engineering side. Um, and then as you kind of get more experience and immediately there's higher expectations on that and uh, inter, uh, facing with more stakeholders that don't have the same uh, technical background you do. Um, and I think the, the most important thing is understand that there's always um, an ask or a want, like you're dealing with people, not just computers. Um, and that um, there, there is a certain, um, there's something, there's a goal motivation that you're trying to get to and if you don't have the common language it's hard to actually have the conversation but if, try your best to actually understand what they're actually asking for it'll save everyone time in the end because building the wrong thing is the most expensive thing you can do um, and uh, you basically I mean there's, there's a lot of things you can do to improve that communication and work on but it's one of those things I find that for myself at least I've had to constantly work on and improve um, in terms of, uh, especially as my career advanced, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a necessity um, to work on that communication. And um, yeah, I, I said, let, let, let them explain, like, let them put those requirements out, gather and get in the, get used to the process of reading, repeating back to them what the, the, you think they're like saying to make sure that you understand what's going on. Um, don't, I, I don't try and come into presumptuous. There might be limitations to the technology. There might be things that you can't do, but don't, don't sign that <coughs> off until you understand what they're actually asking. Uh, that's probably my biggest piece of advice. To sum it up, business people are coming to you with what they think is a solution to the problem they're trying to solve. It's not always the best solution, just like your solution is not always going to be the best solution. But going forth and asking what problem they're trying to solve with the solution is going to get you far closer. It may be that what works within the code base you're working in, there's a very small workaround that will get the same result without having to code the large feature. So try to get to the root of what problem they're trying to solve with the solution so that you can work together to come up with the right solution. Business people are people too. They have constraints, they have budgets, they have uh, data requirements. They're there to be a partner, not just some person who's dictating to you what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, keep in mind that we are all in the same ship and we're all trying to go in the same direction. So as a developer, you are guaranteed of the technical part of your, your solution, but as business, they are responsible of the all business experience and business logic handled by the codes and sustained by the code. So well, you're here to work together and not to confront, assume the best from the people you are working. As I guess there is some, sometimes a few people that are toxic in any organization for sure, but Everybody. always assume the best from the people you are working with because nobody wants to hurt you. They all want their problem to be tackled, that's important. All right. Uh, does anybody have something else uh, related to this topic or should I go to the next, next question? Yeah, okay. We have this so-called Finnish audience syndrome, which means that we have to work for it. So I guess the next question is, what skills should every web developer have? Oh, I, I, think, I think this was going to be a hard question at first because I'm like thinking all these technical skills, but no, um, it, it is, I mean, it's funny. I don't, I think soft skills and people skills are actually really important. I, it's, it's funny, even as a, as an engineer, a career engineer, the, the, if it, because beyond that, when you're developing software, there's always different requirements like, and sure, having uh, certain skills around uh, how you can analyze problems, certain patterns that you can apply are all valuable things. Um, and you will develop them over your career in many different areas. You're going to, you're going to learn, you're going to learn everything and then relearn it all over again in a different way, like 10 different times. So um, 
this like learn how to learn you know that whole thing but like the, the specific knowledge will carry with you it'll give you experience to be able, the ability to classify and pattern match stuff but like the f- the funny th- funniest thing is as time goes on um the the thing that stays in common and this is similar to the last question is that you're, you're usually dealing with humans so um uh i i think just you know learn specific skills that'll help you um, for your next set of goals, get, get good experience that learn them fully so that you can, you know, bring them knowledge into yourself, but recognize that there's just, you're going to be doing this your whole career. So just, just keep doing it. Drama students in high school probably have you beat on communication skills. So if you have the opportunity to do any public speaking or presentations, Mm. do it. It's hard and it's scary, but you're going to have to do it a lot. You're going to have to fight for your point of view. You're going to have to explain why you believe the way that you do. And you're going to have to do it with someone who was not coded with the same language skills that you have or the same vocabulary. So being able to meet in the middle is going to be important. If someone asks a question, answer with documentation. If the documentation doesn't exist, write the documentation, then answer with documentation. One of the worst things that a company can lose is tribal knowledge, the historical knowledge. So the documentation that you end up putting together, whether it be code comments or actual written essays, try to explain why more than what. The code will tell you what. But you need to explain why it needs to be this way. And that goes into my next quote of documentation is a love letter to your future self. You are your best enemy. (laughs) (laughs) Three weeks from now, you will not remember a thing about what you just coded, but you're going to have to go in and fix a bug. So any of those code comments you wrote, any of that documentation you wrote is going to help you get up to speed very fast and be able to walk you through and remind you why you needed to do it the way that you did. And then always be training your replacement. You cannot get promoted if you're the only one that can do your job. You cannot move on to the next thing if you're the only one that can do your job. Being able to, again, write that documentation or pair program or review merge requests are all extremely important to making sure that more than just you can do your job. Yeah, I guess that um, you can learn everything you want because it's not that complex. It's, it's technique, it could take time, but you will be able to learn anything that you want if you know the basics. So learn the basics of the web platform if you want to work with the web. But most of all, I guess that the more important skills are probably humility and curiosity. You have to be humble about what the others have made because there has always been a context that leads to some decision at some point. And when you review the code, even your very own code, months after um, you wrote it, you, you might be just thought, what? what did I do that? What did they do that? It's always easy to blame the others, you know? Why did they do that? It's just a piece of crap and why, why? But uh, there was always context. And when you know the context, and this is where documentation is really helpful, to understand the context, to understand why some decisions were made at some point, you could be humble enough to just say, okay, okay, I understand why it is designed like that. Maybe it's not the best solution and we could improve it. Maybe it's the best solution that we can have in this specific context, so let's keep it. And... Um, and yeah, stay curious because we always learn from each other. So build in the open, learn publicly, fail publicly because it's important to fail, to learn things. And yeah, you will be an experimented developer for sure. All right. Thank, thanks for, for these answers. Uh, I can move to the next team unless somebody has something to add. Okay. So in, uh, in the world of web development, uh, we sort of have this privilege or problem that every single day somebody writes a web framework. Uh, as you could see yesterday in the presentation, 
we really have a lot. But the question is how to choose between all of these frameworks. Like how, what to pay in mind when, when choosing one. Uh, like how, how do I know, should I use SolidJS or Marco or Svelte or React or Vue for my project? Like what, what should I use for the new project? First. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the other developers on your team. What do you all know? Go with that one. Because chances are you're gonna be able to solve most of the problems with the language you already know. After that, you may have special considerations that you have to keep in mind. If you're working in FinTech, for instance, then uh, you're going to need to work for speed and efficiency and ridiculously fast updates, especially if you're dealing with stock markets. So then you're going to be choosing things that have very small builds and very fast responses. But for the most part, most of the work that you'll be doing doesn't require as much specialty as you think. So in the end, the language you know is almost always the one that will work. Yeah, I was gonna say, when you're, when you're the one making the decision or parsing, that's definitely what I'd say. The other side is if, which one, I guess, to learn. And in that thing right now, the answer is actually very simple. It's, it's one word. No, none of them, you think? Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, I, I think there, there is a job market consideration that is a real thing too, and, and I, and I think, I think, for example, on JavaScript side, I, I, everyone's probably should be aware of what the like the the most popular or most used in the job market thing is. Like, I think everyone should learn React. I think honestly, then it's important to to be able to use like the framework or tool that is most used everywhere and understand like at least the concepts of it because those concepts will transcend um because essentially when you have something as popular or as react it, it's actually it's not just the specific technology you learn you learn the the language you learn the, the concepts because it actually transcends any single one framework um there, there is a whole like web fundamentals against frameworks thing and I mean it's a hard place because like obviously um, I, I learned web fundamentals first but that's because of the time period there weren't frameworks and now that there are I, I can definitely see a value in kind of learning both in parallel um, being able to kind of understand the web uh, foundations and being able to learn what people intend to do with it there they are in some ways surprisingly similar but also surprisingly different worlds um, so the, the, there, that is a pretty big breadth of knowledge to, to, to get mastery over, to be fair. But um, uh, I, I think I, I think I, I do think that these days that is kind of baseline knowledge for for getting getting into the, this stuff. And in terms of being able to choose, um, you know, there, there's a certain aspect of it of like whatever will uh, pay you the most money. So um, and that's. But yeah, I mean. <laughs> Look at the industries in which you're going to be working and see which framework's the most popular. Look in the area that you want to work and see what, in, what frameworks are the most popular. Where I live, React is the most popular. That's true. However, in a different location, Angular is huge and therefore React is very tiny. You're not gonna have that local uh, community to be able to help support you. <clears throat> so, look at where you want to work and look at the industry in which you want to work and find out what language is most commonly used or what framework is most commonly used. Yeah, you're right. There, there is also, as you mentioned, in some places, technical uh, reasons for choosing those frameworks, but it comes out a lot less often than you'd expect. You mentioned FinTech, e-commerce uh, is, is, an, is another place. Mm, similar, yeah. Yeah, where like, it's all about page load and that lends to certain types of, of, mm -hmm. of technologies um, different than other ones, if, if you're if you're building interactive AutoCAD type systems in the web, you're going to probably end up in a very different uh, framework um, than one that's designed for spitting out pages as fast as possible. And if you're coding in blogs, you might want to learn PHP. It's still very valid, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that community is the key. I guess that the best framework is the one that won't give you headaches. So you need people to help you to support you in your different efforts. And community is, is definitely what you need to help you to work with the different solutions that you will have. In a previous company I, I was in, 
Um, we had this discussion at some point because we were making a lot of web application all running into the brother. And we were wondering which framework do we need to pick to restart and revamp every new application that we wanted to develop. And uh, it was the very beginning of, of Svelte. And we had a really great uh, experiment, really great path with it. But we finally choose not to go with Svelte and prefer to pick React because of the community, because it was an open source product and because we needed people to contribute to the product. And Svelte was too early to get enough people to be on board and, and to help us to build the product in the end. So yeah, you have to bet on your community. But I, I wonder if in some cases, the, actually, the solution is no, no framework, use the platform. There's always, in a Twitter feed, there's just the platform. As the accessibility so advocate, I back that up so hard. <laughs> Learn HTML, then go from there. I mean, there's some value in understanding the fundamentals. Hmm. Because even if you're a really good React developer, it doesn't mean you understand HTML or CSS or accessibility. So these are, at least in my view, these are valuable skills to have that you need even with the framework. There's a specific reason why you'd use a button over a link. There's a specific reason why you use a link over a button. There's certain reasons why you don't necessarily want to have a lot of content inside of a button. There's ways that you can get around accessibility, but it is highly complicated to try to make those things continue to be accessible across platforms and browsers. So if you can rely on the frame or just the platform to begin with, starting with those basics, then everything else becomes easier. All right. Uh, does anybody else have something to add to the topic or? I wanted to ask. Uh... When uh, most of you recommended uh, React, do you have a conflict of interest there? Because you are from React Finland, right? Is that related <laughs> or? I, I, I don't really, actually, I have a lot of respect for React, but I'm actually speaking at React Finland about my own framework. So like straight up not React. Um, I, I, think, I think you just gotta be realistic. I mean, I, 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 there's a I, different, as you mentioned, in, across the world, there are different pockets stuff. Obviously where I'm from North America, React is like the thing. I know in Europe, it's different. I know in Asia, it's different too. And Mid-North America is a whole large, group of the community you're forgetting okay yeah yeah um i guess i'm also yeah, on the coast yeah yes, okay. yes the coast to react and everything in the middle is angular mm. yeah okay um that's interesting I, I, it's the map of that yeah. but yeah generally speaking um uh my love of react and stuff uh and just the reality of things is, is more pressing it's not because i particularly i here's the thing the, the challenge of react from my perspective is because it's so big and so popular, at least in the zone that I live in, um, there is this like chicken the egg kind of problem where like no one's going to try something else anyway. So it never will gain their momentum to actually ever change. So I would love to see people try um, different things. Um, you know, if, if, if there is an opportunity to try salt or solid or something, like maybe give it a shot. Um, it does have some benefits in different areas. And if it makes sense for you, you know, do that. It just, I, I have to be pragmatic, especially when talking to people, I'm not going to like come in and be like, yeah, you should just do this because there, there's something that can be said for an uh, established track record for like, uh, you know, a huge ecosystem tool, like just go ask questions. Someone else has asked it before you'll get an answer, you know, that kind of aspect of it. So that, that's, that's why I, I push uh, React in that kind of uh, question, even if I would love to see people try different things. In terms of employment, React is a great choice. But uh, I mean, from my personal work, I dropped React a couple of years back. And if you really want to go to the deep end, uh, then, then you, I show you what you do. You find this thing. You go and read, you, you study the platform. Uh, and, and, and then you find this thing. Yeah. And then you write your own state container. And then you write your own web framework. And then you go to conferences to market it. That's how you do it. But that's the deep end. I call that conference-driven development. Yeah. Yeah. Were we talking about how what stops everyone from just writing their own framework? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't have enough frameworks, so <laughs> we need more frameworks every day. 
I have now, a top out imposter syndrome, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, my point is that when you start writing your own stuff or your own things, you actually encounter the problems the frameworks try to solve. So they understand maybe the value of the frameworks yeah. as well. That is, that is true. I mean, having gone down that path um, myself, um, for me, it was a platform, again, a platform specific feature that drove me down uh, sort of web components, um, a kind of a built in way for the platform to make components. So you think, okay, well, this should be easy. Now I can just make, make my components. I can use the platform. And then you start, you start abstracting stuff and you start going, okay, I, I, it'd be cool if we could do this. And then you kind of like, oh yeah, I, I want to do this in 10 different places. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this again and now make a library out of it. And then it just keeps on rolling. Next thing you know, you have a framework. Um, but to be fair, um, I mean, yeah, that's, that's a, at a certain level or a certain place, that's a good place if you want to gain appreciation for the tools you're using. Um, it's also, it's, a, it's one path. I, I, I don't know if that's the path I would necessarily push everyone along. Although I do see there's a lot of value to at least at some point, just go into vanilla and just like build something and just, like something, it doesn't have to be the biggest thing, just build something and just go, okay, this is what's going on. It, you start, you start getting much better appreciation for the tools you're using. Yeah. And it's actually a common practice. Like let's say that you take a course on 3D graphics. Maybe one of the first things you do, you, you, you write the ray tracer, thread tracer, like you write the render, you write the thing that's able to, 3D. And when you have this basic understanding how to do this simple thing, you actually understand what the, how the complex thing works on, on some level. So there's a lot of, there's some value in, in building because you, you learn a lot. Does anybody else have something to add? As I mentioned a long time ago, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes ago, uh, React works well the way that I think, which is why you're going to have to try several to figure out which ones work well with the way you think. But don't forget to try them other, try the others occasionally because you will learn something. In the end, all languages, all coding languages, all frameworks have similar patterns. You're going to find that there's three, four, five major code structure or syntax patterns that exist. And once you kind of understand the paradigms between them, then it doesn't matter what comes next. You're going to be able to adapt to it. But find what works well with the way that you think. Yeah, maybe the, if there's nothing to add to the topic, maybe we can check out the next, next question. So the next, uh, it's employment uh, related. So how do I land my first job or internship uh, in an interesting company? Not just any company, but interesting company. <laughs> interesting. Ooh, fine. Go for it. Like if you guys are still thinking, then I will take my shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as a hiring manager, the things that I look for in a new engineer, I would like you to build something. I don't care what it is. It could be a recreation of Twitter. Doesn't matter to me, but I want you to build something. And then I want you to publish it, get it into production. And then I want you to add a new feature to it and get that into production too. There is so much that you learn by just going through that process that everything else it can teach you. But if you survive to the end of that process and you're still willing to be a programmer, then I can teach you. As far as working for an interesting company, there is a book. It is called Cracking the Coding Interview. It is like 180 algorithm tests. Most interesting companies have designed their interview process around this book. Even though in this book, it says, dear God, please do not design your interview process around this book. <laughs> but they have. So going through those practices, going through those algorithm tests are going to give you a head, going to give you a leg up in your interviews. It'll help get you thinking about it. And it'll help train your brain to start answering those questions 
quickly. Yeah, that's that's good advice. I I it's it's I feel it's funny now because I'm realizing like how detached I am from that now. But like the when 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 I, the building thing is so important. Um, it doesn't matter what it is, just as long as you can actually show that you went through the whole process, understood what you needed needed to do. The thing is, yeah, I mean. The algorithm question stuff and people go on like leak code and they like crunch those and unfortunately it's still such a common practice at, at companies and it's an easy way to kind of thin the number of applicants so to speak so i mean it's a big part of it i, I so much i i i some i i i managed to avoid it but that was because like my, my own personal path was pretty unorthodox and probably not very helpful for people here mostly because i basically kind of I, I actually left university to pursue music and um, ended up having to almost like come in with demos and examples of things I built so that that I could get hired essentially and then they, they were like okay you can be a you can work in QA which it's I didn't like that attitude a little bit because I think uh, quality uh, assurance is actually way, way, way more important. I think now where the industry is, we recognize that, but, uh, you know, a couple or decade and a bit uh, past, you know, that wasn't as, as important of a thing. And it was, it was a matter of just like working my way up from there. So it was, I, I avoided the, the lead code thing, but we, we now we're in a place where there's a certain amount of it. You go to large companies, so you'll get a multi-part interview thing where they'll put you on a panel and you'll talk to a bunch of different people and they'll all have stuff. As, my, as myself being someone on those panels, I, I we have to ask the questions, we do that. I, I just, sh show me how you think. Um, you know, I, I'd much rather give people, as I said, take homes and examples and see their open source, like if they make, have a project published somewhere than that. But if you do get the, if you are in, in, the, in that place where you do have to do those questions, just impress upon me how, how, what your thinking process is, how you uh, approaching it, even it's hard because there's like this pressure and these people are, are, are looking at you. Like it's such an unnatural thing like your work environment will never be like this but try try your best to uh, relax stay calm and you know in the, ask you know ask questions like if people sometimes people get intimidated in that sense the problem is a lot of those questions you don't get necessarily enough information maybe maybe they maybe it's the way they describe it or the problem if if you always try and use everything at available to you in, in those scenarios and and just more importantly impress how you, you're thinking about it because the thing is it was like at the beginning we said there's no wrong questions there, there might be a wrong question in an interview if, they, if, if they're looking for knowledge but if you're talking about thinking thinking outside of the box will also usually get you merited there because it shows thought that's that's the most important thing because we, we we're not expecting to see people coming out of the like, you're not expecting a huge amount of experience here for for more junior positions you're just six you just want to know that if you can teach this person and if they will fit on your team um so yeah i mean that's that's what i can say mm -hmm. yeah keep in mind that interviews it's a process to learn and learn for from outside as a hiring manager to from the candidates, but also for the candidates to learn about the people that will work with. And this is what is really important in the process. Um, I saw a bunch of interviews where candidates don't want to show what they are doing. Their GitHub repositories were totally empty. They didn't want to show any piece of code that they had developed and so on. And, and often this is because they were really afraid about <coughs> being judged. But this is, this is the case, and this is what happened in an interview. We will judge what you are doing to see how you think, and, and this is the perfect occasion for you as a candidate to see how people are evaluating your code. And nobody wants to work with people that are toxic or, or, or judgmental or, or cynic or whatever. So if during the interview process, you can say that the people that you will work with 
are not good enough uh, and will judge badly what you are producing, you probably don't want to work with those people. So it's a perfect occasion for you as a candidate to say, okay, I don't want to work with those kind of people. So keep in, keep in mind that it's not, it's not uh, um, just a, a one-way communication. It's, um, it's a perfect occasion for both sides to just evaluate if they want to work together or not. That's a good point too. And even beyond the technical side, I, I, I remember being the most impressed by candidates that asked me certain questions, like to ask me the right questions in the sense of, and maybe that's a, a topic in itself about like, uh, like about the company or about the culture or about, about what they would be doing and, and understood, <coughs> understood enough or showed enough interest in actually wanting to, to know, um, you know, basically taking the information I'd given them and then kind of thinking about it and asking, asking back, you know, the, the next logical thing. And I, I think I, th that's all we want to see. Ultimately, th th they're going to be potentially, I mean, I guess if you're talking straightly to a hiring manager, maybe not, but once you get into the, like the team level interviews, like they're, they're going to be your coworkers, right? These, these are people you're going to potentially see, you know. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. As someone who's neurodivergent, <clears throat> There are so many different types of interviews out there. If you run into one that just gives you nightmares, everyone has run into those. But as someone who's neurodivergent, I run into them a bit more often than some other people. I am terrible at algorithm tests. I've been a principal engineer that's worked for huge companies and I will fail almost every algorithm test. Not because I can't solve it, but because the way that my brain works is like a scattered set of photographs across the table. I do not have chronological order. I have this weird grouping here and this strange grouping there. So I think of all of the things, all of the stress cases, all the edge cases, all of the different ways this could possibly fail. And then at the very end, I write down what I see. And it usually includes tests and accessibility and best practices. So if you're willing to wait until I'm done thinking, then you can have it all. What they're looking for is something that is progressive, that you start with the simplest solution and then you add in more complexity as you're going through the problem solving thing. But because my brain doesn't work that way, I fail almost every algorithm test. So don't forget that you can ask if there's an alternative. Can I have a take home test instead? Can I do this differently? Can I just talk through my solutions? Can I explain what I'm thinking about? Sure. Sometimes they're willing to work with you. So if you find that there's a certain type of test that does not work well for you, no matter what you do, ask for an alternative. So does anybody have anything to add? No. We have a really good audience this time. <laughs> uh, just out of curiosity, what was your own background and your like skill level as a programmer before getting your first job? And how much did you learn after that? And then how is that different that learning from from actual projects than than actual like just practicing stuff? That is complex. <laughs> oh, that is complex. Have you ask? Yes, I'm like, okay. So I started coding when I was six on a Commodore 64 and basic. Oh, yeah. By the time I was nine, I basically coded Donkey Kong, except there was a prince at the top of that, not a princess, because this girl doesn't need saving. I started hacking the University of Utah when I was about 10. I thought Hackers, the movie, was making fun of me, and they totally failed at explaining what a Pentium was. And I knew because I'd already built dozens. So I started out very early in the industry. Uh, then I went to, <clears throat> there, was, there was a marriage, there was three kids, there was seven years off. And that was after I had been recruited by Caltech when I was 16. Um, so I was double majoring in computer science with an emphasis in software engineering with a minor in uh, computer engineering, and then a applied mathematics with a minor in physics. I wanted to 
program the mines and tra trajectories of interstellar satellites like Cassini and the Mars rovers. <clears throat> so after seven years off, I then went back to school, got a little tiny bit more, but not much. Moving across countries and well, cities. And anyway, residency and expenses, it was very fun. So now I'm a web programmer. <laughs> I've been doing that for a very long time. And in the end, the thing that I learned is that college teaches you how to ask the questions. College teaches you Google food. College teaches you the language that you need to be able to be talking with the same vocabulary that other people that went to college have also received. But if you're self-taught like me, I know what you're talking about. I just didn't learn the words for it. I learned everything on the job. That's cool. Yeah. I guess, yeah, I, I'd already talked a bit about me, myself earlier, but uh, I, I was sure I was going to go into game programming. I, I wanted to make video games since I was a kid. So I guess I have a similar story. And I wanted I, to be a vertebrate paleontologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard because, like, not everyone gets started that early. I was doing basic when I was, uh, yeah, 11-ish. And, and I tried to make my own game engine all through my teens using, like, C and stuff. So, um but I also did music, so I was like kind of torn between playing in bands and 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 doing that. So then, um, it was it was interesting. I said I I I, I did leave university because of the music career, um, but I did go back because it was important to me. I don't know it was important to everyone, and I basically finished my degree while I was working um, uh, at that job where I got hired as a as a, t as a tester. Um, so. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I learned about the, the web, um, by making band websites actually. Um, and kind of the old, it, it, different time though, you could, you could kind of just view source. Like, yeah, you could, it was amazing. You so all of people's code just by viewing the source. So I mean, yeah, everything's minified and yeah. Uh, so it, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to kind of put in the same kind of perspective because people well actually what's interesting i talk to people is like there are obviously um kind of more straightforward paths to getting to where we get to but you'd be surprised how many people come into your industry from different paths and and, mm -hmm. and what impact they make because of the the different experiences right um web is a is a platform that brings people together so having um, different people, different experiences is in, actually incredibly valuable. Um, we talked about it from an accessibility thing with, uh, but it, it just in general, inclusivity in terms of communities and, and understanding uh, what different walks of life bring, bring to the users also gets reflected in people making the decisions and building the software. Um, so in terms of learning on the job, yeah, I, that, that was what I was kind of hinting at before when I was talking about you will learn things over and over and over again. Um, I feel like um, you, you do just kind of, as long as you can keep on learning, you can keep on moving forward. When I went back to university, it was a very different experience from when I was originally, when I was originally there as, as engineering first couple of years, it's kind of a huge course load is kind of expected there. Uh, I remember thinking, feeling a bit overwhelmed um, because it was like one of those things, at least the way that the work where the, they kind of made sure that the course load was hard, that everyone kept a kind of low grade point average and like they, they, they forged you in this the first couple of years. And then um, ultimately uh, when I went back, I felt, I found that my, my, I mean, this is why they have co-op programs and different kind of things. I felt my real world experience had completely changed my perspective and I've, I've things clicked, clicked for me. Um, and uh, it was, it was, it was a completely different, different thing. And it was actually again, working with people and understanding that, that actually helped, uh, you know, doing all those kind of uh, senior projects and stuff. And then I, Worked a bit with some of the like uh, R and D with the kind of master master's class and stuff in, in my fourth year and stuff and yeah I don't know I, I think there's all types of learning and being able to kind of leverage that um, yeah like I, I'm 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 kind of glad to have a, a, the 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 classical training from the point of language like from being able to talk about these things but it it is it's 
it doesn't always come up until it does come up. It's kind of one of those things you like, you you do all your work at your day job, you work on problems that you're working on and you're just like, okay, I need to solve this. And then at some certain point, you're just like, that's kind of like this thing. And then suddenly someone's like, oh yeah. Like, and it's, 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 it's that has a name it's called this. It's, yeah. Like it's, it, and if, if you both went through that, then suddenly you get every, like it, it, it shortcuts that conversation a bit, but usually it, it, it's, it's not necessarily something that'll keep someone out of the loop. It's just kind of interesting how, you know, we get our information from all different sources. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately what you build is going to be the accumulation of, uh, you know, those pieces of knowledge coming from all the, the parties on your team and, and whatnot. So um, I know this almost, I'm still rambling, but. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to interrupt you now. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. It's like before he gives his history. <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah. Back in World War II. Uh, they hired a lot of women as cryptographers. They started by hiring the doctorates that had a lot of mathematical knowledge. And they learned that the best cryptographers were the school teachers and the knitters and the quilters and the ones who had external hobbies. And it turns out that the more knowledge that you have, the more you were taught the more you build a box, the more you define this box and what's possible within this box. And the harder it is to think outside that box. So step away from the code, step away from the education, have different hobbies, music, art, hiking. You will be amazed at how often the different perspectives that you take from those things are actually what bring you back and give you the ideas and the ability to think outside of the box that you've developed for yourself. Also, knitters are some of the original coders. There's a lot of things to say. Um, I guess this is fun, um, I don't know, probably normal, but um, we've got all almost the same background. I'm totally self-taught, I never went to college. Um, I built my first website when I was 13 for my business mom and, and never quit since, even if I did different things in my career and different kind of jobs. But um, the fact is during several years, I was really convinced that we were crafting, craft people, you know, craft men, craft women, working like um, building jewelries from our code, mm -hmm. like little pieces, really sharp. And it was really cool to think, think like that, but industry changed. And right now we need a lot of people. We industrialized a lot of our process and we are building website, not the same way that we did 20 years ago. So, um, so yeah, that, I guess that Microsoft has difficulties to hire something like 25% of their, uh, their staff in terms of developers right now. They're missing 25% of developers in their own teams. It's, it's huge, it's totally insane. And the, the fact is most of the things are uh, more and more connected, more and more um, using software in the end, embedded software or web interfaces or whatever you want. So the fact is that, that we need developers and we need to um, teach future developers not the way we did 20 years ago. So I guess we are lucky to be there um, when we were young because we learned a lot of things by seeing other do things and learn from others. And right now, you will find you will find a job and you will have your own path in your career as a developer or as something else probably certainly i don't know but um but the fact is what is important is to make connection with people when i started my business as a real developer at some point i started as a freelancer and the most difficult part at that point was not to have a lot of people to connect and to discuss and to exchange. And what stands out was conferences. 
because I went to a lot of conferences as an attendee and I met a lot of different people coming from a lot of different backgrounds and we learned a lot from each other. And this is what suddenly rocket sky my, my career. But um, you have to meet people, you have to discuss with people and to keep in connection with people. And I'm pretty sure that um, this is a role of college right now to help you to keep in connection with the other people working in your industry because it's no whole industry. So I have two more points I want to make before we move on. We make, as the world, a lot of web developers. We can stamp them out, hire a ton of them. What makes you unique is what will get you hired. You can always hire another web dev. I can always find another React dev. But I'm hiring you not because of your React dev skills, but because of the other skills that you can bring to my team. Do you have good communication skills? Do you have that three years that you spent in a weird language that gave you a cool perspective? Do you have uh, this, this certain type of uh, SVN experience, like GitHub versus GitLab versus Turtle? So it's not just that you have the ability to code, it's the experiences that make you unique. And that will be what gets you hired. So don't be afraid to try other things. You know, the road to success is in fact paved with failure. And if you haven't failed, you haven't been brave enough. Go forth, break things, and then figure out how to put them back together. And the other point I wanted to make, I cannot remember all of a sudden. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. I think that was unexpected, but I think it was a great uh, topic to discuss. <laughs> and uh, so, do I go to the next team or? Okay. One more. Thank you for asking so many questions, by the way. <laughs> no worries. Stealing the show. Uh, so, you said, or just out of curiosity again, like, what is, what is the difference between uh, like an amateur programmer or like versus a professional, or as you said, like a real programmer, what are the skills that you would like need to be upgraded to be a real programmer in a way? I feel like the only unique difference between an amateur programmer and a real programmer is whether you've actually gotten your first programming job. If you have contracted out, you've become a real programmer. If the only thing that you code is for yourself and not outside of yourself, that's about as close to just an amateur programmer as you can get. But hmm. in the end, there's really no difference. Once you ship something, like when yeah, once you yeah. ship something, you're a real programmer. And so the one, one definition of a professional is a professional is somebody that gets paid. <laughs> so it doesn't tell anything about their skill level. Yeah, it's just that somebody is willing to pay for your work. Yeah, and this is probably not directly related to your talent as a programmer. I mean, there was a lot of people really talented for development that are not paid for that and that are doing this I have an in the open for open source project and so on and are they not real programmer for this uh, reason mm -hmm. i don't think so yes. so um so yeah this i guess this is why i i'm thinking that building in the open is so important because being able to show to others and to let the others take inspiration for what you are doing this is, this is really the key when you are trying to work as a part of a community. Yeah, because like, yeah, open source is a great um, example of a place where you don't really get paid, <laughs> but you're definitely a real developer if you're if putting your software out there and people use it, look at it for inspiration or whatnot. And yeah, just, yeah, it's in a sense, I guess it's, it's easier than ever to, to be a, a real developer because you can just go up there and put your code out there and the second someone downloads it, like, there you are. I mean, that's, that's, that's really what it, what it takes. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a question of like professionalism and it's in terms of like the engineering kind of. We all started out without that and yeah. we are here now. Right. And we started out our jobs without that. Right. Yeah, we're here now. Yeah. So the, I think, I think that's quite often where like that distinction thing kind of comes from, but it's like it, it, talking about a, 
a, it's flimsy at best. It's a different, a different sort of thing, right? In terms of like, yeah, I think software is, is also unique um, a bit on, on, in even the certain level of the engineering field, because uh, as I said, I, I did do the more traditional engineering course and you go through that whole, the, the whole thing, right? And you do a whole bunch of courses on your, you know, your responsibility and morality and ethics in terms of like your responsibility for what you put out in the world. And that's like part of the thing that they impress on you. Um, but uh, like the thing is, what's interesting about software specifically is it, how easy it is to go from concept to, to materializing it. Like um, the, 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 there's less of a materials consideration, like, um, like, and anybody can have an idea and almost anyone can put that to, 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 to reality. So um, yeah, this, this is probably why this, this distinction hasn't made as much of a difference um, in, a, in, a, in our industry. But I, I also wonder when you consider about I mean, anyone can do this, but when you consider about things like accessibility and whatnot, uh, about our responsibility um, in terms of, uh, you know, quality of what we put out there. Um, it's something weighs on me a bit, I guess, just because of like working in a framework space, building tools that others will use, how, how much by what I do or what I build actually impacts others in a positive or negative way. Because like, I, I know for a fact that pretty much every like JavaScript framework could do better on accessibility um, um, and that I, yeah I mean that's a, that's a different take on professionalism but I'm just still rambling <laughs> frameworks fault <laughs> it's how you use it mm, but I, I, I guess there's like one, one theme that's not discussed so much it's some kind of uh, I don't know what's the right term but let's say professional responsibility because let's say you're going this uh, website or, 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 an app, or an application for one million people and you, you don't know anything about accessibility and you put there a button and then you have a group of people that cannot use it. So I think there's some, uh, a professional is able to, know, to do their work in such a way that it supports uh, this as large amount of people as possible. I mean, but at the same time, it's a, it's a business decision because maybe the business decides that we don't do accessibility, but I guess developer maybe should push back. Business can decide all they want, but you're the ones who write the code. So start with your own definition of done when it comes to best practices and accessibility and those things. Because in the end, it's your pride and it's your work. And you're the one who decides when it's done. Yeah. I think there's some like pride in being, being a programmer or a developer. So the, but that was a good question. I'm oh. called the knitting code monkey for a reason. <laughs> like I'm actually, for a while there, I was more known in the knitting community than I was in the dev community for like a decade. And I've been doing this that long. I would rather quilt than go read some tech spec. You do not have to live, eat, breathe, sleep code to be professional. In fact, the more you do that, the bigger and firmer and harder that box is that you build around yourself and the harder it is to think outside of it. It is important that you rest. It is important that you take breaks. It is important that you walk through doors because our brains reset when you walk through a door. It drops the information from the old room and starts picking up information from the new room. And sometimes that's all it takes to be able to come back and be able to solve that bug that you've been fighting for four hours in 10 minutes. Now, if you are a type of person who eats, breathes, sleeps, code is your hobby, that's awesome. But step away from the projects that you work on on a regular basis yes. and do something fun. Go play somewhere, go try something new, go work on a different tech. But take a break from your work. Mm. It is important. Yeah. Sleep, eat regularly, and walk through doors. Twenty years ago, um, I could have spent all my days thinking of the code that I'm producing, that I'm writing, thinking of the new solution, new frameworks, new new 
new pattern to solve my issues, my problems. So right now, I don't want to do that anymore because it's exhausting, because I've because I got a life. So I, I want to do something else from my free time. And um, a few weeks ago, I had a really strange session with, with my, my therapist. I was saying, okay, I moved to another company because I wanted to have more time for me. So I didn't want to work in a startup anymore because it was too demanding. It's really fun. You can learn a lot by working in this ecosystem really fast, but, um, but it's really demanding too. And I, I don't have any more energy to, to, to deserve to that. But I was really afraid because I was taking all my free time to read documentation. And I, I said to my therapist, what is wrong with me? I mean, I quit my previous job to have more free time right now. And I'm spending this time reading fucking documentation. And, and she said, yeah, but what if you just like reading documentation? And this is something that makes you happy. And in fact, it is. I'm, I mean, I'm a tool nerd. I really love tools. This is something that really passionate me. But I'm reading documentation dedicated to something really different what I'm doing every day to new different kind of technologies or new different stuff or research papers or cryptography or things like that because, because I found that really interesting. But in fact, I'm still reading documentation because this is something that I love to do. So yeah, keep in mind that you have to have fun on what you are doing. Yeah, I was gonna say you, you can completely be like what the nine to five programmer, so to speak. They call you go into your job, do your work, leave, leave it in the office. As I think, as long as you, this is a field where there is learning, things change. So stay curious at work, um, and part of that is having fun. I, I think that's the most important thing. I every. Uh, well, people were like, how did you end up doing what you're doing? It was, I realized that every path that got me to where I am now was f uh, finding places where I, the, the environment made me motivated, which meant that I ended up doing those challenges, ended up doing what I wanted to. If, I don't think it's not worth it to, to do things you like, like if you feel like this kind of pressure outside, if it's actually affecting your life, you don't, you don't want that. Um, it, I can't say that I'm the best example that I'm, I am one of those people who obviously who lives and breathes it. So it's, it's hard, but I mean, I, 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 I it was, I think it's, as I said to say, I enjoy it. I, I think you can, I think there's lots of ways to find enjoyment in what you do. So um, as I said, just, stay curious. That's, that's all you have to do. Just make, keep your mind open um, and you'll, you, you, you you'll do fine with just doing it at work as well. As a programmer, your job is not putting fingers to keyboards and typing for eight straight hours a day. That is not what you're paid for. You are paid to solve problems. All problems are people problems. But in the end, you're paid to solve problems, which means research. And sometimes sitting there staring at a wall thinking for three hours while you work through a problem. Your job is to solve problems. So a lot of that learning can be part of that. It doesn't all have to be outside of work. And part of being able to make this industry inclusive, especially in a world that still thinks that it is a woman's job to be at home, taking care of the kids, making dinner, cleaning the house, is to set the appropriate expectations for yourselves and for your workplaces, that there's a limit to how much time you're willing to work. There's a limit to the investment you're willing to make into this job. Because if you set that limit, then other people aren't meant or expected to exceed it either. We can get stuck in our own technical heads. It is very easy to be excited about this new tech that you just learned about and it would totally solve this really cool problem. But in the end, what the person, our user needs is different than our own technical interests sometimes. So it is very easy to get lost in what we think the solution should be there's a cool problem. 
that says, when you get to an airport, would you rather have your baggage claim right next to your terminal or all the way across the airport? And our obvious solution is, well, right next to the terminal because it's right there, right? But the answer is all the way across the airport based on A-B testing. And you know why? Because it takes you so long to walk there that by the time you get there, the wait is only a couple of minutes. Whereas if we're right next to the terminal, you could be sitting there for 20, 25 minutes waiting for your bag, getting irritated that it's not there yet. So the fact that it took you time makes you think that you only had to wait a couple of minutes for your bag and it was just there. So the way that you think the problem should be solved isn't necessarily the way it should be solved. Sometimes the way that actually should be solved is completely counterintuitive to what you think. That is what I learned from business people. People that actually went out and tested things and tried things with users. Is that the way I think they should be solved is not always the way they should be. Which is why, again, we need to collaborate. I guess that one of the key, as you said, is user testing. We need feedback. We need feedback for a lot of different people because um, it's really easy when you're staring at your code for hours to be in your, uh, what's the expression? Uh, Evolutory tolerance, something like that, in living just yeah. in your bubble and, and totally being disconnected of a reality. And when I work as a consultant um, in, in a web agency, I guess that more than 50% of my time was just politic and not development, just helping people to communicate and to talk to each other, to take inspiration and to take just knowledge from other people that knew better than them what they should do at some point. Because once again, there is always context and there's context coming from business, context coming from production, context coming from, I don't know, politic decision, money decision. And you have to, to keep that in mind. And you can't just say, I'm a developer and I just want to code all day long and that's all because it's not the way it works. So Even for people that are writing code for others to use as code, you're still solving a people problem. Hmm. Your problem, the fact that it's difficult for people to write binary. So no matter how far down this rabbit hole you go, you're still solving people problems. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely. I think I think it's it's funny because sometimes as, a, as an engineer, you're like you, you think about how like you can use technology to solve all problems. When actually a lot of the solutions come from the product itself, like understanding what what the what the actual uh, product needs to do. I, I will say that on very much more rare. It's more the way that they're that side, but it, from the business pr perspective, um, like, because we've been talking a lot from the engineer, like what the, um, they can learn from the business, from the business perspective, so occasionally, very occasionally, <laughs> can be the, the game changer and what, and what's possible. And in, in those cases, it's important to understand the, the relationship both ways, because at, at that point, um, you know, a lot of times uh, stuff gets, and this came up earlier, stuff gets presented to us as like, oh yeah, we, we figured out the, the solution to this problem. And it's sometimes, I'm not sometimes, don't, very often it's better to try and trace back to what the problem is because occasionally, um, as I said, not always, but occasionally the technology can actually make a difference in terms of what that solution can be as long as you understand, understand what the problem is and understand and have enough data to kind of back it up. Because as I said, engineers are typically, typically going to be like, yeah, this technology solves everything. But occasionally, just occasionally, it, it, it does actually make the, the difference. So we have to make sure the, to have it work both ways. But sometimes the problem that you're trying to solve isn't even a problem. Mm -hmm. you, you have to keep in mind also that um, you have to make people proud of what they are doing, whatever the way it is. Um, as an example, my wife is the security operations center manager of one of the biggest industries in France, which means that she's involved in a lot of cybersecurity um, decision based on technical decision, 
because there are some some um, issues at some point or some some um, flows discovered and so on. So some some CVs. So she had to find some response to that, and she have actually no technical background at all because she she went through um, literature and then business school, but she learned the hard way, the technical stuff, and she learned by going to people, to developers, to sysadmins, to DevOps, and so on, asking questions, saying, okay, we've got this issue. How is it critical for you, from your point of view, for use, your business use cases? And how could we tackle that together? And making people proud of what they are doing because they could help you at some point and they could give you an answer that could be part of a bigger thing is something really, really important. If you just consider that your coworkers are resources to help you to, to achieve something without um, helping them to, to really be proud of what they are doing every day, you will love them at some point. So I'll make sure that this video is attached to the Zoom or the link to wherever this is going to be. I do recommend you watch this. Um, mostly about a minute in, there's a five minute video of where they're interviewing Elon Musk about design principles. And it is magical. <laughs> One of my favorite little snippets talking about engineering design principles and how we apply them. So just note, we'll attach that later. I highly recommend it. It also goes back to the conversation of asking what problem we should be solving, whether it is a problem, whether we are just going to let it be a problem when you decide to automate it, when you decide to streamline it, and why we do it all backwards. Yeah. I write a lot of tech specs. I write a lot of tech specs. And it comes down to a lot of communication and conversation with the stakeholders and the designers and figuring out, again, what it is they actually want. And then breaking it down into, which you will hate the word because it is way overused, into its individual components or constituents trying to find the smallest possible denominator and then building it up from there. What is the smallest piece you can build? It's interesting, right? Cause it's like a top-down process for eliciting perhaps, and then a bottom-up process for like, trying to figure out like what to actually build. So you actually, mm -hmm. yeah, you gotta attack things both ways. Um, uh, to really uh, get that perspective because you it's funny because we, we do want to there's a minimal aspect like doing the least possible to understand the most I mean it helps with efficiency it helps with like there's so many things cost that where you, you want to figure out uh, change right you don't want to too much change is a, is a risk in itself so you want to mitigate all these things so you, you're often looking at how to make the least out of the most um, I don't know if that always works completely but but i mean we if you haven't cut enough you haven't cut enough. if you're not adding new features back in you haven't cut enough like there's there's a minimum viable product yeah. and that is not what we release to people that is we've proven that it's possible it is the teeniest tiniest we dealt with the most complicated portion of this to prove that it's possible it's a prototype you never release that after that you have the minimum delightful product that's what you release and it still has basically one feature. And then you add your features on top of that. And part of the reason you do that is to prove that the thing that you built is actually useful in the first place. Because if you spend six months, nine months, two years building this big giant thing and then releasing it and realizing nobody wanted it anyway, or that the industry has moved on from that, then you've wasted all that time. Build the smallest part of it possible, get it out there and then build on top of it. So yes, you do end up with, this is the feature we need, but try to build this smallest, teeniest, tiniest feature 
possible just to prove it. It could be ugly. It could require an engineer like hand code chunks and then run it through something. It doesn't matter as long as it was possible and it was done. That's your minimum viable product. And then you add more to get to something you'd actually release to users. If it's not delightful yet, it's not ready. Um. TypeScript has become valuable for those that are building frameworks or libraries because TypeScript can often help auto complete within IDEs. I have a personal issue with bolting types onto a language that is not a typed language on purpose <laughs> and not necessarily choosing the most important parts of typing to add. Mm. So it has its uses, but sometimes it's uses are not important to what you're building. And going through the difficult task of making the IDE stop complaining about it isn't worth it. So choose wisely. It's like tests, 100% code coverage, you've wasted a lot of time. 80%, 85%, that's probably as much as you need. And I'd say the same goes for typing. Yeah, as you mentioned, it's a, I have my own challenges with TypeScript, but that's because from a library framework perspective, our types have to be like good and TypeScript is not it's on type. I've used lots of type languages. TypeScript is the hardest type language I've ever come across. It's because you're bolting typing onto a language that's not really, meant to be typed. It's really weird because it restricts, like, it makes it really challenging when you kind of like think about, like, oh, how would I ideally want to do this from an API standpoint? It's like, no, TypeScript came in and said no. But I will say this: once it's in place, it does give so much to the to the users. I, I think the difference is like when you're writing a framework or library, like you don't get the put any in somewhere. Whereas if you're writing an application, it, it, it's probably okay. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's not, it's not always worth the time to go in and get the perfection. As long as people are getting value from the types is probably worth having in there. Um, I've, I've, I know a lot of people have been very opinionated the last few years of, about it. And I mean, it does a lot of good things, refactor story uh, and whatnot. Um, the, amount of time I spent in JavaScript before TypeScript probably biases my perspective a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think as long as you can find value from TypeScript, it's, it's worth it. More and more projects support it. You get the tooling benefits. Um, but yeah, as an application developer, um, I, I, I wouldn't stress it as much. As a library author or something, then you get ready to become a master at it. Um, or find people who are really good who will work with you. That was my other point. Oh, <laughs> Finally. I remember now. <laughs> okay. But before that, um, should you learn it? Yes. Yeah. Even just the basics. Do you want to go before I get to my point? Sure. Ultimately, your web brother is just a virtual machine that can understand HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and the WebAssembly. All the rest is just tooling. So if you need something to help you to do something else, then a tool is the right answer. TypeScript is just a tool. And you can see a lot of Reddit posts where people are just saying, oh, I love TypeScript. I can't do any new project without using TypeScript in it. Okay. And when you dig into a little bit, just understand that TypeScript is good for them because it prevents them to do some kind of errors that they are prone to do because of many things, because we are just human, you know? So if the tool is helpful for you, go for it. Otherwise, don't plug things just because it's fancy and you want to plug things in, into it. Your brother don't care about that. It's totally up to you in the end, that's all. If it's a hill you're willing to die on, write a lint rule for it. Your team will appreciate it because they can yell at the computer and not you. So the point that I wanted to make a while ago, there is absolutely no way that you can know everything. And I know that's hard to swallow, 
it's still hard for me to swallow, that I cannot know everything. It is okay to say, I'm not going to learn this thing. You do not have to know everything. And that's the beauty of networking, is that one of the most important things you can do for your career is get to know other people that wanted to learn that thing and learned it well. Because you can rely on them to help you and then you will help them with something else. Because in the end, we're all Venn diagrams. None of our paths were the same. None of our experiences were the same. So we all have overlapping circles. And the goal is that you help them in the places where your circles don't overlap and they help you in the places that your circles don't overlap. So if you're not going to learn it, find someone else who did and become their friend. So that when you have to do it that one time, you have someone who can help you with it. But it is absolutely okay to say, I am not going to learn that because you cannot know everything. So choose what you want to learn. Part of the having fun part. Yes, sometimes you're gonna have to do the parts that you don't like. Yes, sometimes you will have slogs, but don't spend too long there. Uh, <clears throat> so who is the best programmer that you've ever met or worked with and what makes them the best? Oh. Nice question. Mine is a man named Ryan Kanyatu, and he's the author of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I don't have a name right now. Probably people, inspiring people, you know, not, not necessarily the best skilled one, but the ones that comes with the smartest solution at some point, you know, the guy that is coming suddenly in your office saying, oh, I had a new idea and just write it on a piece of paper and you're just saying, this is just so smart. Thanks for that. And yeah, that's all. My heroes are just normal people. Are you still thinking or? Yes. I was, you can, you can think. I have. I have. I have. I mean, it's. I can. I can go. Yeah. It's funny because when I started my career, I had a different perspective, right? When I when I took on, I I guess it was my second job. I I was working at a startup, and the I was pretty impressed. The guy who hired me, I didn't realize it at the time, but within a week I realized it. It's funny. He was a framework author and I, I didn't, I didn't know that. And I even possibly dissed part of his framework in the interview process and he still hired me. Um, and Feedback he, is healthy. yeah, well, exactly. And I, I didn't, maybe didn't re respect that as much at the time. So pretty early on. Um, but uh, it's funny, like how much my perspective changed because at that time I was really influenced by him because he just, he had this drive and he just kept on pushing things forward. He burnt out two years later. Um, and I realized that wasn't what I wanted to aspire to be. Um, which is funny because I, up till that point, I, w I just thought like, this guy was amazing. Like he, he was, he was really, you know, smart. He, he'd come in and be like the 10 X developer that people you read about. The funniest thing about it is that a 10 X developer is uh, sometimes they leave 10 X the bugs in their wake um, because the, you know, the partic might be particularly good at greenfield, like building something really quick. And the, the, you know, there's different types of skill sets where, you know, I leave other people picking up the pieces. And uh, so having to work with someone like that, like a real like rock star developer, so to speak, I realized that, wasn't as cool as I thought it was when I, when I started. Um, although like, as I said, still amazing person, I just, it was just kind of perspective change where now when I look at like wh who I find inspirational, it's, it's, it's actually um, the, the developers are working on both problems that are difficult um, where require thinking outside of the box and the ones that are good at explaining it to other people and people who are actually good at speaking or, or teaching it. Um, that's why, I mean, it's kind of funny because obviously I'm very much in my field, my stuff. I have such incredible respect for people on like the React core team and stuff, like being able to actually take some, a complicated problem, 
find a solution for it and then be able to communicate that to everyone. And that's, that's the, that skill set, watching that go through, um, very inspired by, by people like that, people like Danny Bramoff, or, um, where like they have incredible ability to actually communicate what they're, what they're not just work on the hard problems, but actually communicate it. I know Dan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I knew Dan before he was famous. So. And uh, I can tell you a couple different things. One, yes, they are thinking very deeply. However, they are also stuck in their own bubble where they're thinking about ridiculously complex problems that nobody needs to solve. In fact, a lot of the people that have been on the React Core team leave the React Core team and their minds are blown by the fact that all the stuff that they spent so much time investing on and working on to solve these really interesting, complex problems, nobody uses. Nobody ever uses it. So keep in mind that React is written by Facebook slash now Meta, but they're solving Meta's problems. They're not solving everyone else's problems. They're solving these really weird, quirky meta problems. So there's that. The other thing is Dan has help. He runs his ideas through other people, through the team, through external people who deeply edit sometimes his material. So when we're... When we're looking at the people that we think are really smart and really amazing and we think are the best, oftentimes we think about it this way. We think that they're up here. This is their skill level, their knowledge level, their experience, their intelligence. And we think we're down here. And we think we should be about here. You know, a little lower. Can't be an absolute genius like them, of course. And in the reality is that we're about right here. They're not as smart as you think they are. And you are smarter than you think you are. And it all has to do with the fact that when you're looking at those Venn diagrams, you're standing on your line and they're standing on their line and you're looking at each other. So you see them and the stuff that you two know together and you see everything behind them that you don't know. And they're doing the same thing to you. I guess the definition of fame is that, is that, is that uh, more people know you than you know? They're like maybe you know 10 people, 100 people, and maybe 1,000 people know you're now famous. I guess it's um, what I wanted to add. For, for me, the name is Don Rosendahl. He, he was uh, taking Blender, it's a treatise, so maybe you never heard of it, but it used to be a closed source software that became open source. And it became sort of the uh, leader of the project or is the leader of the project and he had a great vision for the project so it in 20 years it completely transformed an open source a great example of leadership or technical leadership so ton will be my choice i guess that we don't need gurus gurus as the are dangerous we need mentors we need yeah. people to be there to guide you and to inspire you at some point and to help you to find a solution, but not people that are just claiming that they know the solution better than others. We had some in the past. We don't have that much right now, I guess. So I hope so. I think the point I was trying to make is it's kind of like Instagram where you have just that little picture and it's perfect and pretty. <laughs> but if you zoom out, like everything else is like piled with boxes and trashed and, you know, old food from three days ago, but they took a perfect shot and that's all you're seeing. So you're comparing their pristine, perfect living room to your storage room because you always think the worst of yourself. Now, I'm not saying think the best of yourself all of the time and therefore think that you're better than everyone else or that your solutions are the best, but just keep in mind that... Talent is not necessarily about innate ability. You can be the most talented piano player in the world, but if you never practice, you'll never be any good. It has more to do with investing the effort and energy to get past being bad at something in order to be good at something. So the most talented 
the smartest, the best people I know worked for it. 